And you can turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 3. If you have been following along in the sermon card that has outlined this quarter's sermons, um, I would note, as I did last week, that I am deviating from that. I had intended to attempt, I should have known better, to, uh, to treat Paul's prayer here at the end of Ephesians 3 and his doxology in verses 20 and 21 in one week. Well, I think it's going to be three. That's my goal. And last week we looked at Paul's uh, characteristics of Paul's prayer and a call for us as a church to pray and to be prayerful. But I want to keep the, the verses, verses uh, 16 and 17 that we'll be looking at today in their context. And so I'm going to read verses 14 through 21 to you, and then we will dive into trying to understand Paul's prayer here. For this reason, again, that reason, going back to chapter 3, verse 1, that is the same or connected for this reason. Uh, the context there being that we are being built on the foundation of the apostles into a dwelling place, into a holy temple of the Lord. And so for that reason, Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. That, pay attention to the that's in verses 16, 18, and 19. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is Paul's second uh, prayer in the book of Ephesians. Uh, if you recall, he prays in uh, verse uh, 15 of chapter 1. He begins a, a prayer there with, again, for this reason. Uh, because of the faith that he has heard of them, uh, remember that, that there is some distance between Paul's founding of this church and his writing of this letter. And so there are many who had not believed while he was pastoring there, who have now, as a result, Result of the ministry of this church believed, and he has heard about these people who have believed, who, who have these seven blessings that we counted in uh, chapter one of God's choosing and predestining and adopting and redeeming and forgiving and making known the mystery and granting an inheritance, and certainly, of course, uh, granting the deposit of his spirit as a guarantee of our salvation. And so he's heard of these Ephesians. Who, who he had not known, who have now placed their faith in Christ, and so he prays. He prays in chapter 1 that they would know the riches that have been granted to them. I think it's hard for us to fathom. I read an article about Bill Gates and his estimated $96 billion worth this week. And he said that money means nothing to him and he's got houses and, I mean, there's nothing he, he couldn't have that he wanted. And when we think about the fact that that, that is just a fraction of what God owns, that God owns every life, every planet, every star, every atom, every person, the cattle on a thousand hills, the penny in every bank account, every penny in every bank account, and that all of that is ours. When we think about that, we initially recoil. No, that's not all mine, but, but we're told that we are given every spiritual blessing in Christ and that we are heirs and co-heirs with him. That every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies has been granted to us. And Paul prays in chapter 1 that we would know 
our riches. But here in chapter 3, he prays that we would live in light of them. We talked last week about this being like a race car. The car is fueled up and ready to go. The race is ready to be won, and the directions to the finish line are given to us in chapters 4, 5, and 6. But here, Paul prays that God would do what only God can do, and that is start the engine of the Ephesian believers. I have become convinced this week um, that I need to uh, work on an area of, of my preaching. Um, and, and that is particularly the area of encouragement and, and, and particularly maybe in all that I do and say, being a little more gentle. I kid you not, I stuck a sticker right here this morning. It's right in front of my face above my notes and my Bible that says, be gentle. And I actually have one here. They didn't come off very well. Uh, I'm going to have to work on it. But this one says, watch your tone. Uh, I, I want to be careful of the tone that I set in preaching, and I'm afraid that too often maybe my tone has been a little hard and not uh, led people to be as encouraged as they might want to be. There's my confession to you and, uh, and an area in which I believe I need to grow as your pastor. Um, but with that being said, I want to share a story with you with great trepidation. Because I don't mean it to be um, discouraging. In fact, I really don't want it to be. And I think that there are maybe some here who will identify with the story. And I think maybe there are others who might say, wow, that is not my experience at all. But nonetheless, I, I want to share it. I received a call, 7.30 uh, approximately, um, Friday morning from some uh, faithful members of our church who said, hey, can you, uh, can we talk today? And so uh, we sat down and, and we talked a few of this. I want to I preface this, that this conversation came from people who are not typically discontent. Okay, that's important. I, I think they are, this conversation happened from uh, or with some people who I can stand before you and honestly say that over the last three and a half half years have been some of my greatest sources of encouragement, have been great servants to me personally, uh, have been faithful to this church, and are involved. But the concern went like this. I've been wanting to talk to you because I, I sense a, a bit of a spiritual deadness among us. The things seem dead on Sunday mornings. That on, on Monday nights at, at the ladies' uh, theology, that things seem dead. In our Sunday school, in, in Wednesday, uh, mor or Wednesday morning community Bible study, that there just seems to be a deadness among us. I think part of that may be because... I haven't been as careful with my tone as I ought to be. Um, there are some things uh, that, that I have been pressing on among us that I think are important, like membership and regular attendance of members. And yet as I, I look to myself, I think maybe I've been beating up the people who are here a little bit over the ones who aren't. What sense does that make? But I want, I, I want the tone uh, uh, of my preaching to change. I've asked some men to meet with me regularly, early on Monday mornings, to, to, to look at my uh, teaching on a Sunday and say, how was the tone? And I'm grateful for those men who, uh, who can do that for me. But... Uh, that, that conversation ended with the question, what do we do? And I said, I don't know. I had not yet looked at this passage yet this week. <laughs> and having dug in here, I would say, I think I know. How, how, how is it that God brings to life 
the engine where deadness is felt. Now, that was Friday morning. Uh, Monday was a holiday. Tuesday, I was in Pendleton. Wednesday, uh, just unexpected scheduling things and the life of ministry changed my schedule. Uh, Thursday, I was in LaGrande at a pastor's meeting. And so Friday morning, I had not yet spent time in this text. Fortunately, because I'm so far behind on the preaching schedule, I was working a little bit ahead, but I spent some time on Friday and a lot of time yesterday looking at this, uh, this passage. And overwhelmingly, I thought, uh, I, I think I know. I, I didn't know what my answer was then, but I do know what my answer is now. And of course, the first and foremost thing that I think this text, as we saw last week, would teach us is to pray. I was reminded of uh, going to the conference in D.C. back in May, and one of the guys at the church there telling the story of, um, of frequently going into the pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist Church's office and saying, hey, I've been thinking about this. And the pastor's response, the lead pastor there, his response was often, I've been praying about that. And, and, and what this man said is he said, what I've learned from that is that this is really simple and really huge. Prayer is doing something. Prayer is doing something. And, and so my first statement is to recall us to last week and to say, pray. But that isn't all. That's just the starting point. Paul prays here for some specific things. In fact, I think he prays for five specific things. He, he gives us three main prayers, and we talked about the structure of this passage last week. And those three main prayers, you can almost see these as bullet points, is the word that in verse 16, in verse 17 or 18, depending on your translation maybe, and in verse 19. Those are the three main prayers, but under that first heading, that according to the riches of glory, he may grant you to be strengthened, uh, that idea that he may grant, that's the main verb. And then Paul gives us three prayers underneath that. So the first prayer really has three, and then there are two more, which gives us a total of five prayers. These are sequential prayers that are marked by these hinna clauses, hinna being the word we, we translate in Greek, uh, or from Greek as that, or in order that. And what we have here is a progression of hinna clauses, or in order that. This happens in order that this happens in order that this happens. And so what we're going to see over this week and over next week is, is the, the five steps that Paul prays for in bringing a church to life. But it all starts with prayer. John Bunyan said this. Because sometimes I think we, let me back up before I read this. Sometimes I think we say, we can pray and that's enough. Other times we don't pray and we work and we think that's enough. And interestingly, neither work. But here's what John Bunyan said. You can do more than pray after you have prayed. You can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. What a great statement. And I think that's what Paul is, is saying here. I'm praying for you, but there are things among that that we must do. And so we are going to look at this five steps over the next uh, uh, two weeks uh, where Paul prays that this church would have life. Each prayer laying the groundwork for the next request. One happens that the next results in, that the next results in, that the next results in. I will try and be careful here, but linguistically in the Greek, this is a difficult passage. And I'm going to try and draw some of that out, um, but I will try and do so carefully. So uh, hopefully I can help you uh, understand what's going on here. Uh, but this week, uh, we, we see the first three requests that are all connected. Here in verses 16 and 
and 17, Paul prays that God would grant. That's our main verb. But, but it needs more. We need more information. Okay, Paul, that God would grant what? And we're going to look at that. But before we even get to looking at the three, uh, th- the three things that Paul prays that we would do here or have here, I want to look at the way Paul phrases this. He says, I bow my knees that according to the riches of his glory. Notice that he does not pray here that God would grant this request out of the riches of his glory. I shared a story a while back when we were in Ephesians 1 about John Rockefeller, who was exceedingly wealthy in his day, who at the end of each round of golf that he would play would tip his caddy 10 cents. That man tipped out of his riches. But imagine a, uh, imagine, uh, a, a missionary comes to Bill Gates and says, Bill, I need support for, my, for this mission I'm going on. And Bill says, great, what do you need? And the guy says, I need, f- I need $50,000 to set this up. And Gates says, great, here's $50,000. That would be giving out of his riches. But imagine that same missionary goes to Bill Gates and says, I'm going, I'm trying to set up this mission work. Uh, I need support. Will you support me? And Bill says, well, how much do you need? And the missionary says, $50,000. And Gates says, great, here's $50 million. That would be giving according to his riches not simply out of his riches. Paul here prays that God would grant these these requests not out of his riches, not from the treasure trove that he has, but according to the riches of his glory, which rewind to chapter 1, we already have. We already have. I've seen real stories of people who, uh, in fact, um, I, I know of some, not personally, but imagine you, you were a, a billionaire begging on a street corner every day. I told you a story early on in this, this series through Ephesians of a, a woman who had millions and millions of dollars, this was 100 years ago, but would not get her son's infected leg treated because it was so expensive and her son died. Paul is praying that we would not live like spiritual beggars when we, when we have uh, spiritual wealth far beyond anything that we can understand. And so Paul is praying that God would, pr- would give us or grant us these requests according to his riches, but not only according to his riches, the riches of his glory, and who can put a measure on that? It is an infinite glory. It is an infinite holiness. It is an infinite worth. It's why Christ, as he goes to the cross, had to be the God-man. Because only an infinitely valuable payment, only an infinitely glorious payment, can make up for the infinitely wicked offense of our sin against the glory of God. And so God here is going to grant these requests. Remember that this is is a, a, a prayer of Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is not only Paul's request for the church. This is God's design and desire. And God will grant them according to his riches and according to the riches of his glory. And first here, we see that Paul asks that God may grant, and we find our first request, that God may may grant you, that is us, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. I want to ask a series of questions that might help us understand what Paul is praying for here. Paul is praying for strength from the Spirit. But where does that that strength go? To where is it supplied? And the answer is in the inner man. What in the world, we might ask, is the inner man? This is a term coined by Paul, found nowhere else in Greek or Hebrew writing. Uh, This is just Paul being Paul here. Uh, 
uh, and it, this is not the only place he uses it, but if we look at this, we find that Paul's uh, idea, his meaning here of the inner man is the real you. The real you. I was by Karen Monty's bedside this morning after she had died. There lay her body, but that was not the real her. The real her was absent from the body and present with the Lord. The real us is not who we are physically. It's not, who we are, what, it's not what we look like. It's who we are inside. It's our thoughts. It's our actions. It's our emotions. It's who and how we are. And so Paul here, in asking us to be strengthened in our inner beings, is essentially praying that we, as individual members of the church, would have strength in our inner beings, or uh, another syn uh, a synonym here that might be good for strength and with power, is that we might have fortitude. I believe this to be a call for spiritual maturity. The question is, what is spiritual maturity? I came across a really good definition this week. This is not mine, but I think it's fantastic. Spiritual maturity, uh, this side of heaven, isn't being sinless. Spiritual maturity is sinning less. I think that's essentially what, what, what Paul is praying for us here. That, that we would have strength in our inner man, in who we are. That we would have not just strength, but that we would be strengthened with power. That God may uh, grant, though, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up statements in my notes here getting ahead of myself, that we would have strength in our inner man, in our inner being as individuals and as a church to sin less. So we are strengthened where? In the inner man. With what? With power. But the question is how? How does this happen? And this is where we'll probably spend most of our time today. And the answer is through his spirit. The spirit is the agent. It is the, the means. All of this is pointless without the power of the spirit. Spurgeon said that churches without the Holy Spirit are like windmills without wind. They are useless until endued with power from on high. This happens when the Spirit comes in and takes up residence among us. Though God grants it, though He is the one who, who grants to us to be strengthened, and the Spirit is the means by which we are strengthened, this is not passive. We don't sit back and simply pray, Lord, strengthen us. Lord, take this from me. Lord, change me. Lord, make me different. Lord, make us different. What this really is, when we talk about, about the Spirit being work at work in us to bring spiritual maturity, is, is a yieldedness to the Spirit. I think that's what it means to live or to be strengthened by the Spirit. This isn't about our just passive, okay, I'm going to let go and let God. No, this is the statement that we are going to live by grace-driven effort. I love that term. It's not mine. I can't recall who coined it. But I love the idea of grace-driven effort. That we're going to get about the work of cleaning up our lives, but we're going to do so empowered by the Spirit. We need God's grace and the work of the Spirit in order to make our work effective in any way, shape, or form. Uh, part of the reason I think this is about yieldedness is because we're told in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, not to quench the Spirit. How do we quench the Spirit? By sin. When our, our lives are filled with sin, the Spirit is, is quenched. So the question is, if the prayer is that we would be strengthened in our inner man through the Spirit, how does this happen? I am so afraid that the next thing that comes out of my mouth is going to be very cliche. This is not the only things that we must do, but I believe it to be, as believers, the first things we must do, that is to study the Word of God and to pray. To study the Word of God and to pray.
Psalm 119, 11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that, there's that conditional clause, the same type we're looking at here in Ephesians, that I might not sin against you. In other words, the, the psalmist takes God's word in that sin might be diminished in his life. Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed. The world, most often in Pauline writing, is a reference to sinful behavior. How do we not conform ourselves to the world? We are transformed. How? By the renewing of our minds. It's why Paul, in probably the greatest, uh, the, the lengthiest section of exposition in his writings, has just got done giving us, I think, almost a 11 chapters of exposition before he even calls us to any living. Paul says, I'm going to give you this big chunk and this, this is how your mind is transformed. It's why Paul always teaches truth in his epistles before he calls us to live that truth out. We must be conformed, not to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. John uh, 17, 17, Jesus, the night before he dies, prays for us that God would sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. John 14 25 and 26, uh, Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to die. He's going to be leaving them. And they say, no, we don't want you to go. I can imagine their reaction. Imagine Jesus being here in front of us, tangible. You can touch him. You've lived with him for three years. He says, I'm on my way out. See you guys later. No, no, Lord, stay. We need you. And he says, no, no, it's to your advantage that I go. What? What? To your advantage, Lord, how is it to our advantage that you go? Because when I go, I will send the helper. And he will remind you of all the things that I have taught you. And I think it's the primary work of the Holy Spirit is to, uh, to bring this truth to light. Doris asked me recently, how can we tell when and where the Holy Spirit's working? My, my answer, not my only answer, but my first answer is when people understand this. That is where the Spirit is working. Because that's what the Spirit brings to mind. We dig into God's Word and then we respond to Him in prayer. A lot of my prayer life, and, and, and this is not a good thing, has been spent um, starting in prayer and then reading Scripture. Because I want to ask God to illumine uh, His Word to me, and I still do. But that role is really reversing. I need to hear from God much more than God needs to hear from me. And when somebody comes down the stairs or needs something from me and, and uh, my time is interrupted, which is a, a perfectly okay thing. But in the end, if all I've done is talk to God and have not heard from God, I'm probably on the short side of that equation. And so we dig into God's word. And plus, when I read his word first, it gives me something to pray about, to rejoice over, to thank him for, to claim. Not a name it, claim it kind of way, but, but in the, this is the promise of God to me. And, and, and who can thwart that promise? And so we read God's word and we respond in talking with him as Paul is, is doing here. In, in other words, um, I, I think of this like, you know, forming a metal object. The word is the material. It's the metal that goes in. Prayer is the forge and the spirit is the fire that brings it all, brings the heat and brings it, brings shape to what was once shapeless. I think the question we must ask ourselves, probably not so much as a church, but, but this is an individual call here, that the individuals would be transformed in this way, that we would be strengthened with power in our inner beings, is how much time do you spend working on your inner being? Uh, let's just, I, 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 I initially asked the question this way, how much time do you spend on the outer man? I tried to put together a, a conservative estimate here, okay? Um, ladies, you guys are at a disadvantage here because <laughs> this list does not include makeup or hair curling. But if you're, if you're quick in the shower, let's say that takes 15 minutes. 
If you're quick with a razor, let's say that takes five. Let's say by the time you've eaten three meals, taken a half hour lunch break, uh, maybe a little bit of time for breakfast, a longer time for dinner. Let's say you spend an hour and 15 minutes eating each day. If you exercise or walk, uh, maybe you spend 30 minutes. Maybe you take 15 minutes putting your clothes on, taking your clothes off, trying on another outfit, putting on your pajamas, finding a robe when somebody knocks on your door. Who knows what? Let's say cooking you spend 45 minutes. At that point in time, we are at approximately three hours of time invested in the simple appearance and maintenance of the outer man. And as we saw from 2 Corinthians last week, the outer man is wasting away. It is, it is in decline. It is getting worse. I was reminded this week, maybe this is a, a, a good or a not good week to be this personal, I don't know, but Friday was the year anniversary of Dick's passing. And I heard from many how much he was missed. The wasting away of his body didn't bother him. Because his spirit was being renewed day by day. He wasn't moving towards death. He was saddened by the idea of leaving some of us behind. But his spirit was moving towards life. And those of us who were around him had the privilege of seeing this sweet joy in the midst of struggle. Because while the outer man is wasting away, the inner man is being renewed day by day by day. This is part of my struggle with the simple idea of small devotions. I'm going to read one verse and a paragraph on it and get about the business of my day, and I've put the Lord first. But man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What if we, as individual members of this church, what if each and every one of us in this room committed to spending an equal amount of time on the inner man as on the outer man in just those things? You want to see a church come to life. That's how it happens. As the material of God's word is poured into our lives and as prayer is the forge where the spirit of God applies the heat and shapes us into something. Make no mistake, when dross is removed, it's a painful process. When I lived in Hillsboro, actually, I, I had a friend um, who, her and her husband, went to Seattle for a weekend. And she said, the coolest thing happened. We stopped by this little jewelry store. And we went in, and, and the, the jeweler had this little bowl and a burner underneath it. And, and I asked him, I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm refining silver. And he'd look down in the bowl every once in a while and scoop some dross off the top and set it aside. And, and, and she asked him, she said, how do you know when it's done? He said, oh, that's easy when you can see yourself in it. Talk about a refiner's fire. God's word goes in, prayers the forge, the spirit lights it on fire. And it ain't easy being melted and burned and having the, the dross taken out of our lives. But it is good for us, it is good for the church, it is good for the world, and most importantly of all, it is good for God's glory when he can look down into the bowl of our lives and say, I see myself. But what if we spent that much time on the inner man? What, ha what happens when time is short? These are convicting questions for me. I don't get these perfect at all, so please don't hear that. But, but would, you, would you forego a meal in order to not forego prayer? Would you skip makeup for meditation? Would you avoid television for Bible reading? Would you set aside Facebook for intercession? What man takes the priority in our lives? When the busyness of the world creeps in, what man or woman takes priority? Do you continue to feed and clothe and dress and fix up the, the outer man? What are the non-negotiables? What bread must we live on? 
I think that's what Paul is getting at here. I want you to be strengthened with strength, strengthened with power, by the agency of the Holy Spirit in your inner being. As we work on the inner man, as we see the riches that we have, as we see that, that life is, is fading here, but that we're being renewed day by day towards, towards heaven. That's Paul's prayer for us. And so this first prayer is that we might be strengthened with power in the inner being of ourselves. And notice the next statement. So that, what does that result in? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Paul's second request is that God might grant a savior in our hearts. This might seem weird. Wait a minute. I have to cut out sin in order for Christ to dwell in my heart? That seems legalistic, does it not? But I don't think that's what Paul is saying. Paul has made it clear in chapters 1 and 2 and the first part of 3 that these people, he has heard of their faith. They are heirs to all of the blessings of God. They have received a Savior. They are being dwelt or built into a dwelling place of God. So what is Paul talking about here? Well, he takes a verb that means to dwell, and he adds the, the prefix down, that Christ may dwell down in our hearts. So if you remember from chapter 1, we saw that, that Paul prayed... Um, when he says, uh, oh, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith. And, and if you remember, I told you that what it literally says in the Greek here, he adds two prefixes for it. Because I have heard of the down among you faith. But that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in, in English. But when you take, when you take a, a, a noun or a verb in Greek and you add a prefix to it, you add a preposition to the front of it, you end up with a verb that is stronger than what it came out as. So we are already becoming six times he uses the word ikos or ikeo in, in chapter 2. That is the Greek word to dwell or for house, depending on whether it's a noun or a verb, to live in. Um, he uses that six times there that we are already that dwelling place. But now he changes it that, that Christ might dwell down in your hearts through faith. I think the idea literally here is that Christ might settle down. That he might feel at home. This is not to say that Christ would be removed, but I think we could clearly say that depending on what our lives look like, Christ could be more or less comfortable there. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, don't join yourself to a prostitute because you are the dwelling place of God's spirit. He didn't say when you go to sin, God's Spirit leaves. He said, no, you, you drag the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, into that sin with you. And I think it's difficult for Christ to settle down in us that way. And so, so Paul is praying here that, that when, when, when you give attention to the inner man, when, when you are living in, in a way, in a grace-driven way by the power of the Spirit, in, in success uh, relatively over sin, where you are not necessarily sinless, but progressively sinning less... Christ settles down. He, he makes himself at home. If you recall back to Genesis, in Genesis chapter 18, when God comes to visit Abraham and Sarah, he enters their tent and joins them for a meal. And they prepared their house before God came in. But when, in the next chapter, Genesis 19, when it comes time for God to pull Lot out of uh, Sodom, he sends two angels. What's the difference? Abraham dwelt in a tent prepared for a dwelling place for God. And Lot, though scripture would indicate to us, was a righteous man, lived among unrighteous people. And so God looks at Abraham's tent and says, I'll come share a meal there. That I'm comfortable with. But Lot, I'm sending a couple servants because I don't dare go there. Christ can be more or less comfortable in our home. There's a, a short book. It's a, um, 
now the word's escaping me, but um, it, called, by Robert Munger called My Heart Christ's Home. And, and it's, uh, uh, it, it, he uses the idea of our heart being like Christ, or being for Christ's home as an analogy. It's an allegory. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, it's an allegory um, where, whereby the Spirit of God comes into the believer to prepare a place for Christ to dwell. And he goes into the library and he looks at the books. It's like our minds. What, what books are on the shelf? What books are we placing there? What are we feeding into our minds? What kind of novels are we reading or television are we watching or images are we Googling? What, what are we putting into our mind? What, what will Christ find in the library of our minds when he comes in? And, and then Christ goes into the living room to see what's there. And this was company kept. What kind of company do we keep? Again, this uh, has to be taken in light of Scripture. Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians not to associate with any sexually immoral brother who bears the name of believer. And then he says, I didn't at all mean people of the world. He's saying, he, he's saying that, that um, Christ was known as the friend of sinners. But, but what about our, who's your best friend? Outside of your spouse. Do they love Christ? What kind of company do we keep? Where do those conversations go? And then he goes into the closet as other places as well. And in the closet he finds uh, protected sins. The things I'm just not going to let go of. I know they're sins, but somehow I find them beneficial, and so I'm hanging on. Well, it's not until the Spirit comes in and cleans out the mind and cleans out the living room and cleans out the closet that Christ settles down into our hearts, that he is uh, uh, dwelling down there. But if that's the proper interpretation of this, Logan, why, why does it say through faith? That seems like an initial drawing. Well, uh, it's not. Why does Paul include through faith here? Because all of this is dependent upon faith. All of it. There will be no real spiritual power in your life. There will be no victory over sin. There will be no lasting change. The best you might be able to do is put systems in place to organize and control your dysfunction. But until there is faith in Christ... And Christ comes and dwells in us. And we are strengthened by the Spirit and the Word to clean the sins out of our lives progressively. It's a slow process. So in one sense, be patient with yourself and others. And in another sense, be your worst critic. <laughs> I don't know how to work that out very well. We're going to be tempted one way or another. You're going to be tempted to be really hard on yourself, or you're going to be tempted to be really easy on yourself as pertains sin. But I really love something Tim Keller said one time, or in, in a book, when he said, he said, you are more wicked, you are more depraved than you could possibly fathom. And there are some of us in here who think we're not that bad. And that's the message we need to hear today. That we are desperately depraved. But we are also more loved than we ever dare imagine. And maybe some of us need to hear that here today. Maybe you've got a good handle on just how wicked you are. And you need to hear just how loved you are. Or maybe you're here and you're like, well, I'm pretty good. God loves me. And you need to hear just how desperately wicked we are. We cannot understand the height of Christ's love for us at the cross until we understand the depth of our depravity before the cross. But if you're trusting in yourself, if you're trusting in your own goodness, if you're trusting in your own righteousness, if you're trusting in your own strength for any of this, for any right standing before God, for any spiritual life, you will be sadly disappointed. We, we have to come to Christ and say, you were perfect where I was not. And you died 
where I should have so that I can live where you do. Because he, as we read in Hebrews this morning in Sunday school, is the only one with the power of an indestructible life. John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. You see, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, there's step number one. As the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, here's how it goes. Here's the ordo salutis, to put it in old Latin terms, the order of salvation. The Spirit draws. And because of the work of the Spirit in our hearts, faith is placed uh, in us by God and in God. Faith is not a thing. It is not a dependent. It's, it's, it's not a work because it is precisely the dependence upon someone else and not the dependence upon ourselves. If I may make a statement so bold as we saw in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it is not faith that saves you. It is Christ who saves you through faith. This is why it's not a work. Even the faith is granted to us by God in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Once that faith is placed uh, in God and by God, the Spirit and Savior begin to dwell in us. The Spirit begins His work of sanctifying us, the slow process of sinning less, of being conformed into the image of Christ, and the Savior settles in. J. Vernon McGee about this passage said this, In Christ is the high word of this epistle. The wonderful counterpart of it is that Christ is in us. In Christ, that is our position. Christ in us, that is our possession. Wow. Wow. And so when our lives are being cleaned up as we give attention to grace-driven effort, spirit-empowered work by the Word of God, forged in, in prayer, our, our, our home for Christ gets cleaned up and Christ settles down in. And what happens next is that we are... Now, this is where the language gets a little um, confusing. Because if, like me, you're reading the ESV, it says in verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend. This is not going to be something I do very often because believe me when I say I want you to have great faith in the translation that you hold in your hands. Um, but I don't think that's the way this should go. It doesn't really change the meaning of it, by the way. But if we're reading this in the Greek, here's how this reads. Verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, being rooted and grounded in love, that you may have strength to comprehend. If the, the, the being rooted and grounded in love comes before the that in the Greek, and if the being rooted and grounded in love is describing you as the ESV translators have put in here, it is the only construction like that in Greek that we can find. It, it's almost unheard of that something f before a that would connect to something after a that. Why? Because Greek doesn't use punctuation like we do. It uses words. This that is almost like a period. It's the next bullet point. And the being rooted and grounded in love comes before that. I think it's a synonymous request, one from agriculture, one from construction, but I think Paul is praying for the same thing. And I think this request connects to what God is still granting. In other words, this this is what I think Paul is getting at. That when by the Spirit the inner man is being cleaned up, and when Christ is settling down comfortably in your hearts, you are rooted and grounded in love. 
It's when Christ is comfortable at home in our clean hearts that we feel his presence and his affection and his approval most keenly. Now, I want to be very, very careful here. God's affection for you never fades, never diminishes, never grows, never shrinks, because it is entirely bound up in Christ. Not in your sinfulness or sinlessness. But when we have sinless lives and clean hearts and the Savior settles down deep, we are in a position where there is sight to see the love. That is when we understand and see that, that we are rooted and grounded in love. And we'll see next week that, that when that process has happened, when we're strengthened in the inner man and Christ settles down and we are rooted and grounded in love, then we have the strength strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is sad to me. Because there are churches out there, there are authors that Jennifer and I have appreciated who in the name of making people feel loved are approving of their sin. And all they're doing is, is encouraging them to maintain houses where Christ is never comfortable, where he never settles in, where there's inner turmoil and conflict if they're genuinely saved, because Christ is not comfortable there. If you want somebody to feel loved, don't approve of their sin. Love them in spite of it. But love them enough to tell them that they're never going to feel loved of God while harboring those things that make Christ so uncomfortable in our own homes and in our own hearts. Approving of sin never leaves people feeling loved. It leaves them with inner turmoil, with a spirit that is in conflict with the flesh. And as the Spirit sanctifies our flesh and our spirit and God's spirit and our flesh are brought into harmony, that is where inner peace is found. And so Paul prays thirdly that we would be rooted and grounded in love. That as, we, as the Spirit settles down or as the Savior settles down deeply, we experience God's love because we experience His indwelling process. It is a slow process. How does this happen? It happens primarily individually. I want to go through this quickly, but fast forward with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. Verse what? 16. And talking about Christ here, and we'll get to this passage in the coming months, but we're told that Christ is the head of the church from whom the whole body, now we get a description, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. This idea of joint is literally every connecting point. We saw in 1 Corinthians that, that the body of Christ is like a physical body. Each has a part. My son is walking around in a leg brace because connecting parts became disconnected. And things don't function properly until those parts are connected properly. But more than that, what we're about to see here is that each part has to be functioning properly. So he says that the whole body, joined and held together by what every jo with what every which joint with which it is equipped. Now we get into the, the main idea of what the body is, that the body, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow. Is that not interesting? The body makes the body grow. How does the body make the body grow? When each individual part is strengthened in the inner man, and Christ is settled down, and those, come, those two connecting points come together, the body grows. When each part is functioning healthily, when each part is strengthened from the head that is Christ, then the body builds itself up in love. 
How does a church, let me rephrase this. How do you bring life to Athena Baptist Church? You focus on the inner man. You pray. You fight sin. You dwell on God's word. You let the spirit sanctify you. And as we do that together, and as each part of us is functioning properly, those connecting points, when we come together on porches and in living rooms and over coffee and pie and wherever else, when each of us is working properly, all of a sudden we get joints and ligaments and internal systems. There's an interesting analogy in my own children's life. They went into some friend's house last night, and they have a friend who affectionately goes by Lulu or Lexi. Her real name's Alexandria, I think. She's a neat kid, beautiful, but she is tiny. She's the little itty bittiest thing I've ever seen. Well, she, um, we had sick people. We were given tickets to go to uh, the um, Happy Canyon, and we had some sick people in the house. So Lexi came with us, and we, we had parked, and we were walking in. And she brought it up, but when she was born, she had uh, a, some kind of syndrome that through a series of surgeries has repaired those things. But, but she had uh, uh, internal parts that, that, caused, that, that weren't functioning properly properly. And she needed surgery to put those parts back together. I asked her, because she brought it up, and it was a perfectly fun conversation, I said, so is being so short part of the syndrome? She said, no, that's just the result of having internal organs that didn't function properly. The body didn't cause the growth of the body because all of the parts weren't working properly. But when each part is working properly, when each part is, is gone, pray selfish prayers. Before you pray for your spouse, pray for yourself. Before you pray for the church, pray for yourself. Because when those interruptions come in, the best thing you can offer your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, or this church is a you that's right with God. So dig into God's word and pray over your own life first the best thing you can offer to those around you. Because when, when, when those are, when, when we are properly functioning parts, when we're doing the work that we need to do as our part, those connecting points become the place where the body begins to grow. And so, word before Facebook. What's your, what's your sin? There's obvious ones. There's not so obvious ones. Word before computer. Word before the bottle. Word before complaint. Word before whatever. Word before discontentment. There's my confession to you. Complaint and discontentment. Even if I don't express them, they rise up in my own heart and mind. And it, it just... It's amazing that, that Paul tells us, I believe it's in Romans, that all of Israel's grumbling w was to set an example for us of just how heinous the sin of grumbling is. When I grumble, I should pick up this book. <laughs> and then, when those are the lives that we're living and we connect here, at home, at work, at church... The greatest source of health for Athena Baptist Church doesn't come from how we organize programs or gatherings or anything else. Our greatest health in life comes from how we eat and exercise spiritually before we gather. Before we gather. We need food and exercise. We need study and service. We need preaching and prayer. We need worship and witness. We need preaching, we need prayer, we need fellowship. But all this happens best when there is sanctification. When there's the killing of sin first. When we rely on the Spirit for that process. And Christ settles down deeply in our hearts. And we're rooted and grounded in love.
much easier would it be to serve one another in the difficult places when we're rooted and grounded in God's love for us apart from the way anybody else treats us? And we'll see what the next two prayers are next week. But let's turn to prayer.